Good morning and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about the Kenyan elections, the Kenyan presidential elections, which are going on today. Um, it's late afternoon in Kenya, so we'll be hearing results probably later this evening. Uh, but here to talk about it, we have uh, several experts, uh, including our host for this morning, Ambassador Charles Ray, who's the um, chair of FPRI's Africa program, and who also is a former ambassador to Zimbabwe and the Kingdom of Cambodia, as well as a 20-year veteran of the U.S. military. Um, our guests this morning are Gilbert Kadiagala and Paul Nantulia, and they will be discussing the Kenyan election and the implications for that country and for beyond. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to our supporters and members for joining us today and for your support. We can't do it without you. Uh, we'll be putting a map of Kenya and of Africa in the chat. So if you wanna orient yourself, you can check that out. Also, about halfway through the program, we'll be going to your questions. So put them in the Q&A box and you can go ahead and start putting them in uh, anytime. Don't, you don't have to wait until we go to the formal Q&A portion of the program. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ambassador Ray. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Uh, as, uh, as President Flynn said, we have two distinguished experts on, on Africa with us today, Professor Kadi Agala and Professor Nantulia. Uh, both are quite uh, knowledgeable of East Africa, the whole, well, of Africa in general, but, it's, but in particular, Kenya and, and East Africa. We're going to be talking about elections that are currently, that are going on as we speak. The polls in Kenya should be closing uh, before, our, before our presentation is completed, uh, but I think we probably won't be seeing results of the election uh, until much, much later in the, in the day. Uh, the, the outcome of this election uh, will have a great impact, not just on Kenya, but on the region uh, writ large. And our two uh, guests will be discussing that. Uh, they will each, uh, starting with Professor Kadi Agala, uh, speak to us for about three or four minutes, uh, putting, putting us in, in the picture and explaining the context of this. Uh, then we'll have a, a brief discussion uh, and then, as, uh, Professor, uh, as Pr President Flynn said, we will then uh, go to uh, questions from the audience. And so with that, I will uh, ask uh, Professor Kadi Agala to please make his remarks. Thank you, Ambassador, Flynn, uh, Ambassador Ray and uh, President Flynn for the invitation to this very important webinar. What I want to say today is that uh, Kenyans are going through an election. There is a very close election, but it's also a very meaningful election for the country and for the entire region. I think the broad context of this election is that um, it is going to, first of all, resolve a political stalemate that has existed in the country for the last four years. A stalemate that was occasioned by uh, the fallout between the outgoing president, uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, and his deputy president, William Ruto, uh, who is now running as one of the key uh, leaders in this election. I think uh, the stalemate is important because the divorce between the two leaders has essentially created an electioneering process over a four year period. Uh, and therefore it is important for the country, at least for this election, to end that stalemate so that in fact the country can get on back to its, uh, its feet. And uh, I think that is important. The second point I want to make is that these elections will, will mark either the end of Raila Odinga as a perennial candidate 
a perennial presidential candidate. This is his fifth time to be running. Fortunately, this time he has obtained the support of uh, Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, and characteristically, <laughs> because Mr. Ruto, who was the deputy president, was supposed to be the heir apparent. So Odinga is either going to benefit from the support of Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, or he may actually, if he loses the election, and uh, then he will have, in fact, to go home. I think the bigger context also is the deputy president, William Ruto, who has been running, in fact, since the last elections. He's been campaigning for the presidency since the, the, last, ele uh, the last election in 2017. He's a strong contender, largely because I think he's had time to campaign as a deputy president. But as I think, as I mentioned from the outset, he has been frustrated by the lack of support from the outgoing president. So we're going to see how this stands out. And it's important, therefore, to watch these elections, because what that means is that they are very, very closely contested. But the other thing is that we've seen already in the last six, seven hours that even though the elections are largely peaceful, there have been the usual bungling by the Electoral Commission of Kenya. There are a lot of complaints that are emerging from some parts of the country that the voter registration processes, that the electronic voter uh, registration processes that was used is actually failing. And these failures are actually causing a lot of concern as we speak now. Some, some, some voters have not, have not voted because their names do not appear on the electronic roll. So the country has decided, at least the Electoral Commission has decided to resort to manual, uh, manual registration. So it brings a very interesting component here. These elections need to be clean, fair, and transparent for Kenya, in fact, to emerge from the stalemate that I've been mentioning. If they don't, in fact, appear to be transparent, fair, they'll cause problems. And we've seen this before. Uh, Kenya went through a very difficult moment in 2007, following the bought election at that moment. So the expectation this time, at, at least, the election is very close. Uh, and the candidates who are running Mr. Ray Laudinga and Mr. William Ruto have very high stakes around winning the presidency. The final point I think in the introductory remarks I want to make is Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta. He's the outgoing president. He's backed Mr. Odinga and a very difficult arrangement because he's backing on the fact that the Kikuyu, his own people, then will back Mr. Odinga for the very first time. And this is a very difficult moment for him because it affects his legacy. Is his candidate, his preferred candidate, Mr. Mr. Odinga, going to make it? Or is his Kikuyu constituency going to revolt against that and therefore give the vote to Mr. William Ruto? A very dicey moment, therefore, for his legacy, but also for the entire country. So let me leave it at that, and then we can pick on other themes as we, as we, as we, as we continue our discussion. Professor Nantulia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ray and President Flynn. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, Professor Khadiagala is one of my personal heroes uh, as, a, as, a, as a young student in Kenya. Uh, so it's really an honor and, and, uh, and, and a privilege uh, to share this uh, uh, panel with him. Um, I will focus on, uh, on six main issues. I'll, I'll generally look at the broad, the, broad strategic, the broad strategic trends that we see in this election uh, that make it 
uh, unique um, and perhaps more consequential uh, than elections we've seen in the past. Uh, I think the first is uh, looking at the front runners, uh, Raila Odinga and uh, William Ruto. Uh, both candidates have aggressively, and I mean aggressively, uh, attempted to mobilize young people, to mobilize the youth. If there's been any election in Kenyan history that has been so focused on getting the youth vote, uh, it is this election. Um, if you look at the uh, election manifestos of the two campaigns, uh, the Kwanzaa Alliance and the Azimio La Umoja uh, Alliance of, uh, of uh, Raila Odinga, uh, all the um, core elements uh, that are in those campaign um, uh, platforms are trying to appeal to young people, uh, trying to mobilize them. Um, uh, you know, there's a very interesting use of uh, coinage, uh, Swahili coinage, uh, coinage of uh, sheng, which is uh, uh, it is a uh, it is it is a franca uh, in in uh, very popular among young people. It's like a slang slang uh, you, you know terms uh, terms of art uh, that that are very much part of the Kenyan of, of, of the connective tissue of Kenyan of Kenyan youth. Are very much front and center in these in these campaigns, and I think this is significant. It's very significant because it shows it shows um, it shows how much the Kenyan elect the, the Kenyan electorate is transforming, and it is transforming in line with African trends, namely that the median age in Africa is only 18 years. Uh, this is the youngest continent uh, in the world, um, but at the same time, it is a demographic. This youth demographic, uh, you know, is 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 badly affected by uh, by by unemployment. In fact, youth unemployment in Kenya is very very high, uh, and in other and in other countries uh, as well. You know, countries like Uganda and so forth is very very high. So I think that's the first that's the first key issue uh, for me. Um, the second is China. Uh, interestingly, the People's Republic of China has been a key campaign. It has seeped into the campaigns in a very significant way. Namely, there's so much, uh, uh, there's been so much tension uh, around the uh, SGR, the Standard Gauge Railway from Nairobi to Mombasa. And uh, very interestingly, Raila Odinga and William Ruto as political elites were, were very much involved in this, in this particular process. It is a legacy, it's a legacy project. It's a project that uh, the Uhuru administration um, uh, 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 invested heavily in, um, uh, in order to secure, in order to secure that legacy that Uhuru Kenyatta inherited from uh, President Kibaki, which is uh, he wants to be seen as, like Kibaki before him, wants to be seen as a leader who delivered critical infrastructure, but not just any kind of infrastructure, but infrastructure that that um, that creates employment. That is. Um, labor intensive uh, these labor intensive industries in kenya tend to swallow youth uh, and so again it's also connected to the first point but it's the issue of corruption that uh, uh william ruto very interestingly is is is, is articulating as we know uh, there have been several uh, high court rulings uh, and a parliamentary action demanding uh for um the demanding that the Kenyan public uh, receives um, accountability from the executive branch concerning the circumstances surrounding that a particular agreement, which has still not been made public. So that's an issue that both sides have been have been trying to have been trying to mobilize in their campaigns, and I'm I'm quite sure that the Chinese embassy is watching is watching things very very closely. The third point, which Professor Kadiagala mentioned, is ethnic outreach. So the so. We see a very interesting realignment of um, of the elite elite politics in Kenya, which has generally been driven by the ability of candidates to mobilize ethnic and regional um, uh, constituencies of support. The Kikuyu um, uh, 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 base is extremely important because not only is it more populous, it's the most populous um, uh, election uh, constituency in the country. Uh, but it's also, uh, you, know, you know, quite wealthy. And if you look at the patterns of wealth distribution uh, in the country, you know, the Kikuyu right from independence have always been very, 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 very central, very, very key. And also in terms of supporting election campaigns. So this is really critical because in the previous, in the previous closely fought elections, 
uh, we've always seen, um, like in 2007, for instance, we saw sort of quote unquote an alliance between the between between the Luo and the Kalenjin, which was uh, uh, Raila Odinga as the main candidate and his current um, uh, adversary William Ruto, who are who are on the same side. You know, versus versus the Kikuyu constituency, and we saw the uh, the violence that erupted uh, as a result as a result uh, as a result of that. Uh, but this time around, both candidates have have Kikuyu running mates, uh, which is which is which is critical in the case in the case of uh, Raila Odinga. Interestingly, that candidacy involves a woman, the first woman um, running mate of a major of a major presidential ticket in Kenyan history. So when one looks at the dynamics of uh, elite politics and violence in Kenya, one would uh, basically make the assessment that perhaps these elections might not be as violent as previous ones, simply because these two blocks are extremely critical. The Kikuyu block and the, and the Luo and, and the Luo and Kalenjin block are very, very critical in terms of um, whether, whether, whether elections will be, will be stable or not. So that is critical. And if we look at all the, if we look at the, um, the battleground constituencies uh, in the country, right? Um, the way the, the election system is designed in Kenya, both candidates have had to have had to spend a lot of money and a lot of time outside their home turfs. So I think this is another very, very interesting, very interesting dynamic uh, as, far, as far as the ethnic and regional dimension is concerned. Very quickly, the fourth dimension, uh, as I look at it, uh, really, um, reinforces certain patterns uh, of Kenyan politics that we've seen since independence, namely that the political process tends to be dominated by powerful political families. Um, the Odinga family is well known. Uh, his father was, was uh, initially close friends with uh, 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 President Kenyatta's father. Uh, both of them are seen as fathers of the nation, co-fathers of the nation, co-founders of the nation before they fell out. Uh, and so Odinga has tried to uh, present his candidacy as a part of a of um, of a rec of an unfinished reconciliation between his father and Uhuru's and Uhuru and, uh, and Uhuru's father. Uh, Rail, um, William Ruto has tried to use the slogan of the hustler nation. In other words, he's appealing to the fact that uh, he is basically his own man. He made himself, he's a self-made politician. He did not rely on a silver spoon in his mouth and so forth. This is basically what he's trying to articulate and it's, trying, it's resonating among some constituencies. But if one really looks closely at, uh, at, at, at William Ruto, uh, he, he also comes from, uh, I mean, he's been able to establish the Ruto name as quite, quite significant in the, in the politics of Kenya. So in a sense, there's really not much of a difference in terms of how, in terms of how um, in terms of how he's positioned himself, Kenyan politics tends to be dominated by by, by powerful by powerful families with 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 vital economic stakes uh, in in the country. Um, the third, the fifth uh, element uh, is um, this very interesting dynamic of incumbency versus outsiders. Now, both of them are incumbents in the sense that uh, Raila Odinga has the benefits of um, being supported by the incumbent president, right? But he is trying to project himself as an outsider in the system. Very, very interesting. Uh, William Ruto is doing the same thing. He is presenting himself as an outsider, uh, that he's not an established candidate by virtue of the fact that he fell out with his old uh, comrade. However, he has the trappings of incumbency by virtue of the fact that he's vice president. Right, so it's a very, very interesting dynamic that I don't think we've seen before in a in a, in a Kenyan election, and it might be a factor in terms of whether we see, um, you know, the levels of violence that we're going to see, that we're likely to see in this election, might be tamped down by the fact that uh, the security services do see both candidates as 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 incumbents uh, in, 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 in 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 some in some sort of in some sort of way. Then the final element is uh, the issues around the election. So Professor Kadiagala mentioned the manual voting versus the electronic voting. The electronic voting system they're using is the same system that uh, caused serious complaints last time around. And uh, in fact, there was a court case. Uh, there was a court case. Uh, Professor Kadiagala might have followed that, um, where uh, you know uh, courts were, were were requested by civil society to um, 
uh, to pronounce themselves on this on this on this particular issue and to allow manual voting because of the uh, the discrepancies that were found uh, in, in the in the pre-election in the pre-election period. So it's very very interesting that uh, the IEBC chair uh, uh, Chabukati, who was at the center of the storm last time, uh, has said that uh, you know they're going to resort to manual voting in some of those uh, uh, districts because he refused, uh, you know, the IABC refused and insisted that the electronic voting uh, system was, uh, was, uh, was okay. So it will be interesting to see how that issue is resolved. But um, let me stop there uh, so that we can have a, a broader discussion. Thanks. Well, well, thank you both. Very interesting. I have a few questions before we go to the audience that, that I'd like to, to run by you. Uh, starting with this, this interesting dynamic of two insider outsiders, uh, and with the incumbent president supporting the challenger to his vice president. Uh, and and I, I, I saw a poll yesterday evening. Apparently, uh, Mr. Odinga is, is a few percentage points ahead in the polls at the opening of, of the polls today. What is the... I, I'm trying to get my head around if, if Mr. Odinga loses... What impact not only does that have on the Kenyatta legacy, but what does that do to Kenyatta's party uh, and to his his main demographic group if the person he supports fails to win the election? How, how do you think that will fly, if you will, with the with the Kenyan polity? Yeah, uh, let me let me let me go first. Um, no, I I think. If if Odinga loses, I think it will it will it will have a a damaging effect politically on uh, President Kenyatta because he is effectively um, he wear he wears the mantle he wears the mantle of uh, of uh, of Central Kenya uh, he is um, you know he's viewed as uh, somebody who has come of age. Remember that uh, uh, his Kikuyu uh, constituency uh, rejected him uh, when when he was uh, President uh, Daniel Arap Moi's heir apparent. And he lost very, very badly in that election. And then he had to bounce back and sort of climb and sort of create himself. Uh, you know, there's, there's this, you know, the, 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 Kenyan, the Kenyan electorate is very interesting. And this kind of takes me back to my, to my school days in Kenya and my university days in Kenya. It's a very interesting electorate in the sense that um, it, 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 it's, it's, there's, an appealing, there's an appealing quality to... Um, and this is something we saw emerge in the in the in the late 1990s, an appealing quality uh, towards um, you, you know associated with 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 politicians who who are self-made, right? And that's and that's the reason why William Ruto is is really harping on that. It shows it shows how much he understands it. He understands this this dynamic uh, within 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 the Kenyan within the Kenyan election within the Kenyan uh, within Kenyan politics. And we saw that we saw that when when Uhuru lost. It was basically a firm rejection to Kanu elites, the old Kanu, the Kenya African National Union elite, right? And 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 it goes down. It goes down to that, you know. There's that there's that spirit among among, among Kenyan youth. There's that, you know, that attraction to 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 candidates that are able to break free, to break free from from sort of political from political families. So I think that will be the it it, it will damage his legacy, but at the same time, it will be a reminder to his own failure uh, to capture the election when he was supported by a very powerful uh, incumbent uh, in, 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 pre in President in President Moy. So it will be like a repeat of history. Uh, so so that, that's how I'm looking at it. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's a very, very interesting and fascinating aspect uh, uh, of the election. And at the same time, if he loses, the young people will, would have sent a very powerful message, will have sent a very powerful message that perhaps there could be some gravitational shifts going on in the, in, in, in the Kenyan, in, in, in Kenyan politics, such that next election, um, uh, folks will want to, uh, will effectively want to do what Ruto is doing, which is basically trying to project themselves as self-made. As self of course, uh, uh, Ruto will have challenges in the sense that he's really seen as part of the elite, but uh, let's, let's see what the results say in a few, in, uh, in, in, in a few days' time. Okay. Uh, Professor Kadiagala. Thank you. I think uh, I agree entirely with uh, Paul on that issue. If Raila doesn't win,
Uh, we lost Watching him. Mr. Odinga. Uh, we lost the sound there for a second. Sorry, yeah. So he took a big gamble in supporting Mr. Odinga. And uh, we'll have to see whether, in fact, that gamble pays off. Uh, but I think, as Paul explains it, it's very dicey. I think one of the things that could happen is that uh, a lot of the Uhuru's uh, previous supporters may actually turn against him. Uh, so if they did turn against him, it depends on whether Mr. Odinga can, in fact, get more votes that would compensate for the loss of uh, a Kikuyu vote. I mean, the figures are clear. They, they are saying, you know, he needs at least about 30% of the Kikuyu vote for him to make it. Uh, but that means yeah, he's also doing very fairly well in places like the coast province, or the, the coast region, sorry, and the western region. It's not very clear uh, whether, in fact, that will work out as, as we speak. Uh, but the, the expectation is that um, he's essentially a state candidate, if we could put it that way, because the state machinery, in fact, has been behind him uh, since Kenyatta made the decision that he was actually the preferred successor. So that's a big gamble, and we'll need to wait and see. Uh, Paul mentioned the youth. Uh, I think the problem with youth is um, there are 8.8 .8 million people uh, between 18 and 34 who registered. Uh, and uh, some indications are that, in fact, that's a very low number. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, a lot of the people are going to didn't register. Uh, a lot of the youth didn't register, but also even the 8.8 .8 million of the youth registered, a lot of them may not turn out. So I think we see them very active very robust on Twitter and all these other social media. But I think ultimately, what we want to see is whether they will go to the, to the polls and vote for their candidate. It's not very clear as north. Unfortunately, a voter turnout, I think, would be fairly uh, normal in a sense that in a contested election of this nature, people tend to turn up in large numbers. And there are no rains across the country, so and, and because rain is an important element. There are people who don't want to stand in long lines when it's raining. Uh, so I think the weather forecast has been very uh, favorable, really, to the two candidates. The voter turnout is going to be fairly good. And I think that's a good, a good sign for, for the electoral process. I'm not very sure about the role of youth poll. That's, that was my point. I think they'll, they have been very vibrant, they've been making a lot of noise, but I think we want to see whether they can, in fact, uh, go and vote. All right. Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the SGR, uh, the rail project between uh, Nairobi and, and Mombasa. Uh, that's a con, uh, that's a project that's been dogged with controversy from, from the very beginning. Uh, but I read in a report yesterday that it has now become an issue in this election. And I have two two part question. One is how, how what's the breakdown of people who are looking at it as a positive versus a negative issue? And two, how do you think you, know, you mentioned the Chinese embassy is probably looking at this election very closely. But how do you think this will impact? Kenya-Chinese relations uh, at the end of the day. Yes, I think it will. It will. It, it will. It will impact. Uh, you know, whichever way the election goes, um, uh, you know, there'll be an impact because both candidates, both candidates are trying to project themselves as strong anti-corruption uh, candidates. Uh, strong candidates that will be fighting against uh, the dynamic of uh, state capture, state capture in, uh, in in Kenya. They both want to want to project themselves as candidates that are that are that are that are championing the independence the independence of uh, of key institutions, institutions such as the such as the courts and parliament, which tend to have a voice on foreign policy uh, in Kenya. These are this is how the candidates want to project themselves, and uh, I think. William Ruta takes it a step further. He takes it a step further by um, uh, openly stating 
that if he uh, wins, uh, he will want to uh, review that particular that particular um, project, and he will want to he he will also want to review all other projects, um, uh, 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 you know, sponsored sponsored by different uh, by different involving different Chinese entities, either as implementers or as or as financiers. And uh, the reason why it is it is it is it is significant in the Kenyan context is simply because the Chinese are by far the largest investors in Kenya in large scale Kenyan infrastructure and large scale public works projects in Kenya. This is not something that started with the Uhuru administration. It goes all the way back to dying days of the Moi regime. Uh, you know, the dying days of the Moi regime. There was this whole uh, look east policy that Moi put in place uh, as a response to uh, complaints by uh, his Western uh, backers uh, around human rights human rights violations. So the Look East policy started then. It uh, picked up under, under President Kibaki. Kibaki was an economist. He was an economist. He was a structural economist. So for him, infrastructure was key. So we have seen um, the Chinese become critical, critical economic partners uh, in Kenya um, who have very strong ties with uh, with the Ken not just with the Kenyan political elite, but also with the business elite uh, 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 to some to some to some extent. So um, it is a it is it is it is a key issue in 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 in, in, in that sense. But then, on, in, in in you know, if we look at it in terms of uh, the FDR uh, in particular, uh, yes, it was labor intensive and uh, absorbed a lot of a lot of labor, especially you know going all the way down to the coast to the coast province where. Uh, ironically, Odinga appears to be to be to be very strong uh, in that in that in that in that region. But then um, that project has also caused an an out an upsurge an upsurge of uh, you know demands for accountability, especially around corruption, the manner in which uh, tenders were were distributed. Right, many of those tenders were secured by uh, companies that had uh, uh, significant backing by different by different political elites. Uh, the Uhuru administration has has been on the block for that, uh, and he's been he's been he's been uh, um, um, he's faced significant demands uh, coming from the from lawyers, from uh, trade unionists, and so forth uh, to make public to make public this 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 um, this this uh, disagreement. Uh, it, it's the most it's the most expensive and the largest project in Kenyan history. Uh, so there's this demand for due diligence. There was the court of appeal pronouncement. Uh, which declared that project null and void on the basis that it violated uh, Kenyan public procurement laws. But this was after the fact. But nevertheless, it provides a it provides a bar. It sets a bar and it sets a precedent uh, for what uh, the Kenyan executive branch will do in future future arrangements of that kind, not just with China but with other foreign um, with other foreign investors. So I think a precedent has been set. A precedent has been set for due diligence, for accountability, and, and that is precisely why both candidates are trying to play this matter up. It just so happens that the Chinese are the most visible uh, in, 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 these, in these big, large-scale legacy economic projects uh, that both candidates are trying to uh, rally around. Professor Kadiagala, you like to add to that? You know, in transport diplomacy, uh, the, there are two issues here. First, the two candidates are being disingenuous because they were part of the decisions are around the Kibaki regime on inviting the Chinese. Losing the sound again. Michelle also was a minister in that government. <laughs> and that's when most of these decisions were made. Uh, so the current politicization of the issue, I think, is very populist uh, in a manner that is actually denying us the truth, which is that uh, both candidates were in fact complicit in the decisions around the SGR and other transport-related uh, uh, decisions. But the second point I also want to make uh, is that the train has already left the station. That means the country has to repay that loan mm. from, uh, from the Chinese. And there is no option. 
uh, I think at this point. So we have this unsustainable debt that was accrued by as a result of elite decisions about infrastructure development. So the key issue, I think finally is what Paul, I think you are correct, is a learning lesson here about transparency, about you know open procurement processes that was missed in this case. The issue is whether the Kenyan elite, in fact, can learn from that mistake. And it, the, the, the story there is not very clear. I mean, these mistakes have been repeated and repeated all the time. Corruption is at the very center of the political process. Both candidates are fighting against corruption. Both candidates are not clean, and everybody knows that. So the issue around how do you confront a scourge of corruption is a bigger question in Kenyan politics. And I think we have to see whether the lessons have been learned uh, and learned carefully. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, one, one final question, and then we'll go to audience uh, questions. There was a, a news report uh, several weeks ago about the role of social media, in particular, I think, Facebook, and, and their control or or stepping down or clamping down on disinformation and negative negative uh, social media communication, uh, particularly hate speech and 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 posts that were that seemed to be inciting violence. What do you think the role is of social media in this current election? Uh, do you want me to go first? Uh, yeah, okay. your, your mic's open. Okay. Go I'll, go for, I'll go first as, 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 as the younger uh, uh, okay. panelist. Yes. Um, no, no, no. I, I, I think it's, it's, it, it, it has, it, it, it's the, the power of social media in this current election speaks to two issues. One, it speaks to Kenya's infrastructure. Uh, Kenya has a better infrastructure than any of its neighbors. Uh, it has uh, more uh, people online uh, than, than, than any of its neighbors. Uh, it's 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 very it's very tech savvy. Kenya is very tech savvy. I mean, Kenya has introduced uh, technologies that others that not that no one not, that no one in the world had. Things like uh, mobile mobile money, which we now use in the United States, is a Kenyan invention, right? The the the, the pesa, the mobile pesa, the pesa point. You know, you know, you're you're able to send money on a phone. These are Kenyan technologies, right? And and and, and Kenyans Kenyans do very very well when it when it comes to this. So I think it speaks to that issue. Uh, and therefore, it should be unsurprising. It should be unsurprising, you know, the, digi the digital side. Uh, and both candidates have, have, have projected themselves as, digit as digital. Uh, they've embraced. They've embraced this. Um, so that's the one issue it speaks to. The other issue it speaks to is the youth demographic. I mean, I mean, Kenyans are very, very creative when it comes to uh, when it comes to the use of social media. When it comes to mobilizing around social media very very effective and i think it's 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 interesting given the fact that uh, the registration was, the youth registration was low and i'm kind of wondering why why i'm kind of wondering why why uh, you know social media was not used to encourage to encourage as many people to register as possible but nevertheless it has it has it has played a role uh, and it has also played a negative role because we've seen a lot of uh, uh, unfortunately we've seen a lot of hate speech we've seen a lot of inflammatory inflammatory uh, uh, um, uh, uh, statements on social media, uh, fake stories, fake news uh, about you know come you know about both both candidates and other and other issues. Uh, we've seen uh, some alarming alarming comments uh, of an ethnic nature of an ethnic nature that have been made. The sort of comments that accompany the violence that we saw in 2007 and in other elections. You know we always talk about the you know, violence in 2007, but violence. Uh, especially in the Rift Valley province. I mean, this is something that goes back to the Moi to the Moi era. So unfortunately, uh, you know, I would say that the social media and sort of digital politics, what I would say digital electoral politics in Kenya, uh, it has it has it has had a positive dynamic in the sense that um, it has it has shown it has shown um, uh, you know the the savviness of 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 of, uh, of 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 Kenyan youth and Kenyan professionals. But then it has also been a platform uh, for hate speech, uh, and this is something that is going to continue to be a problem, uh, not just in Kenya but in other in other African elections, uh, you know, that will be coming up this year. Yeah. Professor Kadiagala. 
No, Paul, thank you very much. I think that response covers the two components of the, the use of the, uh, the social media in Kenyan politics since 2007. Uh, one, it has been very polarizing, uh, inflaming ethnic uh, passions and so on. And we've seen this uh, consistently over the four elections uh, since 2007, uh, that uh, the level of mobilization through social media sometimes, in fact, turns very ugly in the Kenyan context. But I think the more positive element is uh, the, the ability really to mobilize larger constituencies. And uh, given the coverage of internet and so on, I think technologies have been, these technologies have been very, very useful. Uh, but I also want to come back to the issue, you know, electronic, uh, you know, the biometric voting, these are part of the new technologies that in fact they should have been utilized better in the Kenyan context. In fact, to make more cleaner, more transparent elections. But I think what we see is that um, there's a lot of unpreparedness on mm -hmm. the part of, uh, of the Electoral Commission really to do a good job. I think they should be from day one, in fact, be preparing from the next, for the next election. And that means they are for investing even in these very good technologies that are going to enhance a more transparent electoral processes in Kenya. But now we are not there yet. Uh, so I think we have a lot of uh, Facebook, we have a lot of Twitter as avenues of mobilization. But I think we need to do, or Kenya needs to do more in, in uh, leveraging these new technologies actually for, for better electoral processes. Thank you. Thank you both. And now uh, we will go to questions from the audience. Thank you. Thanks for a very interesting discussion. Um, at, following on your conversation about the youth vote, we have a question from the audience asking about the women's voting block. Um, and the question is, is there a woman, women's voting block that might propel Baba and Martha to win? And for those of you who don't know who Baba is, Baba is a nickname for uh, Ryla Odinga, which I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, means daddy. And Martha is his running mate. He named a woman as his running mate. So who would like to take that one? Yes, you know one of the you know one of the things that I, I you know it, it's it's a Kenyan thing you know Kenyans Kenyans love uh, coining terms of art uh, as I mentioned earlier it makes everything very exciting um, uh, and it just it takes me back to my to my school to my school days uh, things things take on a life of their own you know with with the usage of such terms so yes Baba as as he's known. Um, in fact, before Baba, he was known as the uh, first son of uh, the first son of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of Kenyan democracy, simply be because his father was the original uh, campaigner for multi-party politics in the country, and, and was actually detained by his comrade Jomo Kenyatta, with whom he uh, established uh, Kenya as, uh, as an independent uh, country. And uh, Raila was actually uh, implicated. Uh, and uh, in, in, in some of those efforts, like father, like son, and actually even ended up, ended up in, 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 he was detained and even ended up in exile at some stage before coming back and sort of breaking bread with, with Moi. So he's kind of grown from the Kukumfalne. Now he's the, now he's the, he's the big, he's the big uh, Kokoro. Um, and yes, you know, the Baba care, you know, the healthcare is known as Baba care. This is what he's trying to, he's trying to promote. In terms of, in terms of the youth, in terms of the women, well, I, I mean, it, it remains to be seen it remains to be seen, but uh, I mean, we should, you know, Martha Karua is a very strong, uh, is a very strong uh, um, running mate, uh, in my opinion. Um, she made her bones during the struggle for multi-party politics. Uh, very courageous. One of the, you know, there was there was a, there was a there was a cadre of women of women politicians, in, young women politicians, uh, including Martha Karua, who took on President Moy head on, uh, in, in, you know, during times when it was very, very dangerous to do so. So she has that, she has that, you know, there's that, there's that memory. There's that memory of the role that she played uh, and, 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 her, and her courage. 
uh, uh, in that process. Secondly, um, uh, she's uh, she's uh, 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 she, she's she's always been known as a as a very good mobilizer. Um, I don't know what I don't know what the electorate will make of her role in the uh, Kibaki administration, right? You know, after the, after the post-election violence, she was sort of on the other camp, um, which is sort of a typical feature of Kenyan politics. You know, their adversaries in one election, their friends in another election. I don't know to what extent that might that might uh, tarnish that, that might tarnish her. But uh, she's always been very, very strong. I mean, when we were, you know, kids in, in, in university, she was one of the people, you know, there were sort of many names, many names that we used to talk about. And Martha Karua was one of them, right? So uh, it might, it might, it might just tip the scales uh, in favor, in favor of Baba. Who knows? Uh, you know, it, 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 it remains to, it remains to be seen. But the point I'm making is that she's a strong, she's a strong, she's a strong, she's a strong candidate with a strong history and will be remembered by young people who fought for democracy um, uh, under, under, under President Moy. Professor Kadi Agala, anything to add to mm. that? I think the, the women vote has been significant in all these elections. The only problem is uh, whether that vote has all, uh, could ever be translated into a formidable force to elect somebody like Martha Karua. And I should make clear that uh, she ran before. She ran before for the presidency uh, and then she didn't do very well. So the current, in the current context, I think she may have uh, gravitas uh, because she is with uh, a candidate who looks like he's a winning candidate. Uh, so that's potentially, I think, her value is that she could, in fact, uh, help in galvanizing Kikuyu votes for Mr. Odinga. But again, given the uncertainties of Kenyan politics, that's another gamble. Nobody really knows whether she's able really to sway some of the voters who've already been convinced that Kenyatta betrayed the Kikuyu by uh, supporting a low candidate. So it's not very clear whether she will do it and, and we'll just have to wait for the results. Uh, but I think as a candidate, she's a really formidable mobilizer and uh, she's, she's presidential material. I think that's one of the, the calculations I think around uh, Mr. Kenyatta, in fact, foisting Maeta Karua to, uh, to Baba in fact. <laughs> because he is uh, he's 77 years old. If he wins, this will be maybe his last and final term. <laughs> I mean, he will be 82 in the next elections. But I think, therefore, if he does very well, naturally the pressure is going to be the next elections, Martha will be the candidate. And that will be very interesting. Now, now does Martha have a nickname? <laughs> I, actually, I don't know. I, Not yet. I, I, what, what, what they have done is that since uh, Baba is a presidential candidate, some people are just calling her Mama. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, yeah, Mama I mean, Martha. There's a certain alliteration. Yeah, Mama there. Martha, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. We also have another uh, question. Um, uh, kindly weigh in on the potential foreign policy postures by both candidates, particularly as they relate to geopolitics. Um, I think both regionally and farther afield, but I think certainly a lot of eyes are on the uh, Ethiopia Tigray issue. So would you like to start with that, Professor Kadi Agala? I think with respect to foreign policy, uh, Mr. Ray Odinga has had more experience uh, in, uh, in positions of, uh, of African state, if we could put it. I think when he was uh, chosen to be, when he, he went into this alliance with Mr. Kenyatta in 2018, uh, he was appointed uh, as one of the AU, I mean, the key AU infrastructure envoy. So he has a very good record of actually dealing with leaders abroad. His foreign policy, therefore, and his foreign policy team would actually be much more stronger. Unlike Mr. Ruto, who has been very much inward looking, 
Uh, although he could assemble a team that is also going to play a role in regional conflicts and so on, but he's very weak in foreign policy because he's made some, some statements about some countries in the region that you don't expect a candidate, in fact, to make, especially the DRC. And he was accused of uh, belittling the people of the DRC and so on. So, but uh, I think the records are very clear. Mr. Odinga would be much more stronger in foreign policy. Uh, he has experience, I think he has the stamina, but also the ability to appoint a much stronger team than Mr. Mr. Ruto. But again, then foreign policy only comes up after uh, you win or you lose the elections. Uh, Paul Nantulia? Yes, no, I, I agree. I agree with uh, Professor Kadiogala. I think Raila Odinga is much stronger on foreign policy. He's got experience um, and he also has name recognition. I mean, within the African Union, uh, within the African continent, uh, he's also known as, uh, well, his father was known as a Pan-Africanist, a very serious Pan-Africanist uh, who was involved with the liberation movements. And so that is sort of, that is a, that is a legacy that is uh, that tends to be transferred uh, to Raila Odinga. And it's something that he that he uses very, very, very cleverly. So I think he has, he comes from that heritage, all right? And he will be known, he will be known on the continent. At the same time, uh, he's also tried to play in previous elections. He's tried to play the, 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 the distance or maybe not, not so distant link between his family and President, of, President Barack Obama. Uh, and that is something that is uh, clearly aimed at uh, winning, at w winning some sympathy, uh, sympathy in the United States and especially also among, among African-Americans. The Odinga family, has this relationship with African American constituencies here in the in the United States, which I think might serve him. It might serve him well. He has a good foreign policy team. I mean, some of his folks are from the Africa Policy Research Institute, that's headed by uh, William William uh, by Peter Kagwanja, uh, who has uh, really gone out, really gone full force, uh, backing backing uh, backing uh, Mr. backing Mr. Odinga. Uh, Ruto is the lesser, uh, you know, he has he has less experience. He's tended, uh, as Professor has mentioned, he's tended to to be inward looking, but he's also trying to make some moves. So he has visited uh, visited Uganda, um, and uh, that was a very very highly publicized. And uh, you know, his his colors, his his party colors are the same party colors as uh, Yoweri Museveni, and Yoweri Museveni is seen as the elder statesman. He's the he's the is the cuckoo, the big cock of 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 of, uh, of the region, the cockerel. The, the co a cockerel is a very popular Kenyan, Kenyan and African African uh, uh, symbol uh, of, of authority. So Museveni is seen as such, and I think uh, and Ruto has 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 tried to make those inroads. So it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out. Thank you. Uh, we're coming to the end, so I think um, uh, Professor. Uh, Kadia Gala, um, would you like to make some just final comments and then we'll turn back to, to Paul. Some summary mm. comments, things that we haven't necessarily touched on that you're really going to be watching. Thank you. Thank you, President Flynn. I think uh, two main things. One, the ideal outcome would be a very clear victory for either of the candidates. And by clear victory is that you're getting 50% plus one, and you are also able to marshal a majority in 24 of the 47 counties. Uh, so a clear win would be really very decisive. If there's no clear win, what it means is that there'll be a runoff after 30 days. And that is dangerous for the country because it's going to postpone the decision about who is actually going to be the president. And so we need to work that very carefully. I think if we get a clear victory for, for, for Ruto or for Mr. Odinga, it will be well and good for the country. Uh, the other component, of course, is the role of the security forces in the post-election process. Uh, it's not very clear for now. They have remained pretty much neutral, even though I think they were being pushed towards the direction of supporting uh, Mr. Odinga. It is important that the security forces remain neutral 
especially when there is a post-electoral contestation. And that has to be watched uh, very carefully. I think finally, uh, the Kenyan uh, elite, especially the Kenyan middle classes, have this uh, tendency to coalesce very quickly around a consensus decision when in fact they're threatened by violence. I think there has been a lot of lesson learning from 2007 elections about why we find Kenyans need to have much more organized elections. So I don't really foresee a lot of violence because I think the elite is afraid of violence and they want a very steady and stable approach to politics. So hopefully this is what is going to happen. Therefore, it's going to be a clear win. Security forces are going to remain neutral and the violence can be avoided. Thank you. Paul? Thank you. I agree with, uh, I agree with Prof. Uh, we, it, it, would be, it would be good to see a clear win. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, jitteriness and, uh, you know, especially the youth vote has been, has been quite, the youth mobilization has been quite critical in this, in this election. And if you read, if you read the placards that they, that they, that, that show up in campaigns, they're basically saying, you know, we need, we need, we need, we need to be recognized. Our issues need to be, need to be put on the table, you know, so, they're putting a lot of faith in both candidates. Uh, the youth are putting a lot of faith in both candidates, and so if there's perception of unfairness that we've seen in, that we've seen in in, in in other elections, indeed, both candidates have been complaining about quite a number of things before the IEBC. If those issues are not addressed, and uh, we have a situation where there's no clear winner, and we have to wait another month, uh, that could that could that could be a recipe for violence. So I think policymakers need to be need need to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think the other three things that I would say, um, I would focus on the positive aspect, which is that um, here's yet another competitive election. We're here on this panel. We don't know who the winner is going to be. I think that is very, very critical in, an, in, an African, in the African context, where we have elections that are really not elections, uh, you know, elections that, that are essentially staged in order to tick all the, all the, all the books, all the books, um, and, and, and where essentially the winner the winner of an election, it's a foregone conclusion, not in the Kenyan, not in the Kenyan context. And I think this election, you know, with, you know, the Kenyan elections have become more and more competitive over the years. And I think that is a critically important trend uh, for, for, for Africa. Secondly, uh, the issue of incumbency in Kenya, okay, there was, there was a, there was some talk that uh, Uhuru might not, you know, might sort of go, might sort of not, um, handover and, and and of course there's there's you know there's a question as to whether he would uh, sort of be a puppet master in case in case Odinga in case Odinga wins but nevertheless I think the Kenyans have acquitted themselves well in establishing a tradition of peaceful transfers of power now peaceful relative in the sense that we've seen violence in elections but we've seen this as a tradition and I think and I think it's it's critically important that we as we as we talk about the Kenyan polls, we also need to we also need to remember that. Finally, I think there are quite a number of lessons for outside for Kenya's development partners, uh, including the United States. And I think one is to recognize that we have a demographic shift here. We have a demographic shift, and the um, the 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 demand for accountability and the demand for dem for greater democratization is coming from young people. It is coming from young people who at the same time have historically and traditionally been disenfranchised and marginalized from the political process. Uh, at the same time, if we look at the agitation that has occurred in previous elections, the demand for electoral accountability for reruns and, the, and, that, and that sort of thing has also come from young people who, be, who feel that you know, you're, you're in a line for six or seven hours, you cast your vote, and suddenly your vote means nothing. I think that that is also critically important in the sense that development partners ought to be very, very serious in understanding that there's a demographic element at play, um, seriously supporting democratization and institutional strengthening. This ought to be part of the foreign policy engagement uh, of Kenya, of Kenya, of Kenya, of, 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 of Kenya's development partners. And on that note, I think I would like to acknowledge uh, some of the proactive 
diplomacy that we've seen in the past, that we've seen in previous elections, even though the electoral result was not always and uh, was not would did not turn out as expected, but we've seen ambassadors that have played a very very proactive role. I would like to single out Ambassador Aurelio Brazil, who I believe is one of the uh, uh, um, um, who is observing this. Um, I, I would like to single her out because the role that she played and the role that her successor and her predecessor played in Kenya at a time when it was extremely dangerous to do so, when it was extremely dangerous to make elect, you know, pronouncements of you know, human rights and so forth, um, uh, ought to be a, a, a standard by which uh, international partners engage. Um, I mean, this week, we, my colleagues and I are commemorating the death of one of our students, uh, one of our fellow students, uh, James um, uh, Ochola, who we all called Jordan. He was an excellent basketball player and he died at the hands of police. And it's, it, it, you know, we were part of a, of a demonstration uh, that could have gone very, very badly. And uh, Ambassador Brazil, you know, and, and, and her team uh, protected us uh, from reprisals, uh, uh, you know, you know from, from, the, from, the, from the paramilitary police. So um, looking at the role of uh, security forces in elections, uh, and the um, uh, the very very difficult um, um, uh, uh, activities, uh, you know, the difficulties that human rights activists and student activists have have endured in Kenya. It would be extremely important for Kenya's development partners uh, to ensure that uh, these issues, the issues of democratization, the issues of human rights, the issues of student acti activism, the issues of accountability, are really put front and center in any foreign policy initiative. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you to both of our panelists for a superb discussion about a really important election. And to Ambassador Ray, thank you for convening this interesting discussion. I think we'll all be very, very attuned to our, our, our television and our news feeds uh, as we go into the evening to to see what happens. So thank you. And uh, I'll also put in a plug Friday at noon, FBI is doing a program on, or on Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. What does it mean and what does it portend? Uh, please join us for that as well. So thanks to you all for joining us today and um, we'll see what happens. Goodbye. <laughs>